do a lot of traveling. I travel way too much, so I'm trying to stop traveling and, and do more on YouTube and online seminars, but it's, it's a hard habit to break, right? As Tom Petty will tell you. I go to Europe every year. I've been doing that. I, I practiced in Europe for two years when I first came out of school, and I've been going back ever, ever since. I know a lot of people there. The one thing that you notice in the, in the major cities in Europe is that the young people are normal weight. The young people are normal weight. So if the young people are normal weight, then the people in their 40s and 50s, a greater percentage of them, are normal weight. Um, John Bergman, you guys know him, Dr. John Bergman, he does the Cairo cruises all over the world, right? And we just did the one uh, eight days throughout the Mediterranean, a chiropractic lecture on this uh, big luxury cruise liner, right? And um, <laughs> I'll just say, the American people, you don't need to hear them to know who they are. They're big, you can see them, and, and they look completely different from Europeans in general. So the other thing that I really notice is thinking about the difference between people who were in their 20s and 30s, let's say 25 years ago, and looking at people who are in their 20s and 30s today, there's an obvious observable difference. I talk about this expression of glowing health. You know it when you see it. You know it when you see it. but. We don't see it that often <laughs> in America as we used to. And this is something that you really notice when you travel to, to Asia, to Europe, uh, th this, this idea of glowing health. You see it much more frequently in other countries than in here. That would mean no vaccines, no drugs, no pasteurized dairy, no refined carbohydrates, no hydrogenated oils concentration on natural foods and some kind of exercise and getting adjusted. The closer, the closer that you can live to this ideal, the more likely you will be to be a representative of this concept of glowing health. Kind of be, try to be aware of that for the next couple of weeks, that the concept of glowing health. Look for it and notice it and try to pay attention Hmm, how frequently do I really see this? And if you can, if you can uh, compare that to your perceptions, your remembered perceptions of 20 years ago, how frequently did you used to see it back then? It's something that is changing empirically, in my opinion. Okay, there's a guy. As you study the field of holistic nutrition, especially if you have any ideas about becoming a source of information and giving advice to people in this area, there are a few books, there are a few books that I regard as primers in this area, of funda fundamental works, elementary works. They're usually very simple, simply written books. They're not that long. And I'm going to be talking about a few of them today. One of them would certainly be Toxemia Explained by J.H. Tilden, M.D., written in 1926. Toxemia Explained, J.H. Tilden, 1926. You can get a used version off eBay for less than five bucks, I'm sure. <laughs> but it, it's a great book. But I quote, I quote J.H. Tilden a lot. Here's a quote from J.H. Tilden. People are so saturated with the idea that disease must be fought to a finish that they're not satisfied with conservative treatment. Something must be done even if they pay for it with their lives. This willingness to die on the altar of medicine is one reason why no fundamental improvement is made in medical science. I'll give you an example. My friend, one of my best friends, has a, has a little baby. He just turned one year, one year old, right? And so, amazingly, they did not vaccinate this child, and he's in perfect health. Do you guys know what roseola is? 
okay, so, which is a common disease of childhood, right? So he broke out with roseola, the, the rash, the redness, and the spots, and um, so he's uncomfortable, has, has a little fever. So they decide to take him to the pediatrician. Now, I always say, if you're out in the jungle and you see this big cave and it has a sign above it and it says lion's den and you walk into the cave, expect to see the lion there. Okay, so this is my metaphor for what did they expect? So, of course, you know, they're, they're freaking out. They're talking about anti-inflammatories. They're talking about drugs. They're talking about, oh, this, well, this is the time. Now, now he, he really needs to be vaccinated because, you know, if he's got this, the MMR, measles, mumps, rubella is soon to follow. Yeah, I mean, that really makes a, a, a lot of sense. Right now, he's slightly immune suppressed. So at the time when the struggling, the kid who was struggling into some rudimentary formation of his immune system, right? At the time when he is slightly immune suppressed, let's give him three definitely immunosuppressive injections. L let's do that. That's a really good idea. Something must be done. Something must be done. So let's, I always like to compare th this idea with the emergence of the immune system in the little child. Children are born tabula rasa, clean slate. No child is born with an intact immune system. No child is born with an intact immune system. That immune system is struggling into a rudimentary level in the first two years of life. We have evolved in the human species certain normal, mild, self-limiting, immune building experiences of childhood, measles, mumps, rubella, rubiola, fever. You want your child to get these little illnesses, these temporary little illnesses. That's how they're building their immune system. That's how the body, let's take fever for example, okay? The, the temperature uh, goes up as soon as it gets over 100, people start freaking out. Now see, the body is developing its power to create an inhospitable environment. The body is developing its power to create an inhospitable environment for uh, certain pathogens or microbes. If, if it goes up to 105, uh, he's going to get meningitis. Well, how often does that ever happen? You know, one in 20 million among the most immune suppressed neighborhoods that there are in the United States. No, it's, there's always an economic concern be, behind these ideas that everybody has in health and medicine. The particular idea here is to sell anti-inflammatories. Giving Tylenol when the child has a fever, it's immunosuppressive. We are interfering with that child's ability to create his immune system. His ability to elevate his body's temperature, that power, that's part of his immune system. We must do everything to promote that. How do you promote it? You leave it alone. You let it happen. Tilden used to say, you know, there's an old saw, feed a cold, starve a fever. Remember that? Maybe your grandmother told you that. Tilden goes, no. Tilden, Beeler, all these old guys, they said, no. It's starve a cold, starve a fever, okay? Most of the time, the little kids have these fevers because of all the haagen does in choco nuts and all the tra and chicken tenders that you've been giving the kid in the first place, right? If the child is, is not hungry, do not force food on the child who has a cold or a fever. Just make sure he's hydrated, give him juices that have vitamin C and a little chicken broth or something. If he's hungry, if he's not hungry, don't force food. He's developing his immune system. He's usually, he's clearing out. Here's, he's clearing out the trash that you already gave him, which came in too fast 
for him to metabolize it. That's usually what's happened. So give him a chance to survive. Give him a chance to develop his immune system. By no means the worst thing is to give him more experimental remedies, drugs, pills, and potions. You know, I just remember something. Do you guys remember about, now this has been like eight, 10 years ago, and it was really weird. It, it, it was actually in mainstream media for a while, and then it just kind of faded away. But, for, and I never understood it. They never explained it. But the FDA, see if you remember this, the FDA came out and made a public pronouncement that, and they, they listed 50 of the most common cold remedies that everybody buys for their child at Walgreens, you know, is like Robitussin, all these, uh, St. Joseph asked for, for children, all these anti-inflammatories, all these temporary uh, everyday drugs, they came out and stated that they, they had no positive effect on the child's health and they were no longer recommending all of those. D d does anybody remember that? Okay, you do, okay. It, it kind of came and went, it didn't, it didn't get much attention, but that was really, I, I couldn't understand. I couldn't understand the uh, the thinking behind it because you know the the FDA is usually in in the control of the pharmaceutical industry, and what they say is usually for promoting sales of all those drugs and remedies. Components of detox. So it's very simple. The primary components of detox consists first of all of hydration. Now, in this seminar, I, I don't have enough time to to go through the whole water discussion. I do have a whole chapter on hydration on the website, very cleverly titled Water. It's, and at the end of it, there's a whole section on fluoride. But in general, people are, we are dehydrated. The water that you drink in the five cups of coffee every day does not count. For every cup of coffee you drink, you're, you are losing two cups of metabolic water between one and two liters during a detox, during a detoxification, between one and two liters of water is optimum. If you're not used to drinking that much water, it will take you a couple weeks to get up to that because your body just is not used to accepting all that water. On my consult form, one of the items on that three-page questionnaire the patient must fill out, it says, how much water do you drink every day? How much water do you drink every day? And you, you won't believe the answers that people write. Not much, or it'll say one cup. They, they actually say things like uh, five cups of coffee or something like that, pretending like the water in the coffee will count. So, so many of our problems, especially chronic illnesses and chronic diseases, can be solved, if not vastly ameliorated, just by drinking some water, <laughs> okay? At least one liter, at least one liter a day, and if you're detoxing, try to get that up to as close to two liters as possible. So read the water chapter when you get a chance. Okay, diet. As, as we clear out the tract, as we clear out the blood, we're only going to be adding enzyme-rich, enzyme-rich foods to nourish you during the detox program. We're going to go over that in detail. Clear the tract and clear the blood. That's the way I was trained. Now here's another one of these primers for holistic nutrition. If you're really interested in this field, here is one of your early little Bibles. It's real easy to read. Do I have it over there? You know who this guy was, right? Wesson A. Price was the dentist. And in the 1930s, he and his wife went around the world for three years, and he was looking for what? He was looking for the healthiest people. Exactly, the healthiest people on earth. Here's how he evaluated. The healthiest people on earth were not only those who had the long, longest life overall, but who ha had the longest life pain-free with no degenerative diseases. And also they had strong bones, no evidence of osteoporosis. He looked at corpses and everything. It was a very thorough study. It's your note number 45. Oh, I forgot to tell you. 
Some of these slides will have a number in brackets. You go to my home page on my website and you'll see a little button and it will say Notes Seminars. You click on that button and you scroll down to the Live Nutrition Seminar and that's where these, what these notes refer to. Okay, he finally noticed, Wes A. Price finally noticed that the people who live the longest with the most disease-free life, they had certain characteristics in common. All, through, all throughout the world, across the world, they had characteristics in common. Here were the common characteristics. They had a mineral-rich water, glacial, mel glacial milk. He talks about that, you know, if they lived in mountainous areas like Switzerland, and the water was so rich with minerals that it would be milky and cloudy, not because it was polluted, it was that mineral rich. That was one characteristic. Fruits and vegetables, the concept of organic was, wasn't even, you know, important at that time because they hadn't, they hadn't invented pesticides and herbicides yet. Okay, fruits and vegetables. Whole grains, whole grains a very important source of B vitamins as well as essential fatty acids. A little meat, fish, and raw dairy, and that's it. So you could spend all kind of money, South Beach diet, North Beach diet, paleo diet, this diet, that diet. I just saved you a lot of money here. Here's the diet of the healthiest people who have ever lived on this planet. And I'm just really summarizing this. He documents this extremely well in his book, Nutrition and Physical De Degeneration. Now, my opinion is that there is no legitimate program of detoxification which does not begin with the colon. This, this is kind of like a criterion how you can separate the professionals from the dilettantes. Now here was a guy who really inspired me in this field. 11 years university, I graduated from without ever hearing terms like probiotics, mucoid plaque, you know, colon disease. So that, that was uh, Richard Anderson. After a few years in practice, when I first went into practice, um, I began to notice something. I began to notice that, wow, as, as these patients come in year after year, uh, and I'm adjusting C7 and T7 every day, or every time they come in, and then they feel great, and they go out into the world, and they feel great. But after, as time went by, year after year, they were getting bigger and sicker in spite of the, the spine being cleared out. And then I began to realize that, th that there are some other influences. There may be some other influences on total health than just having a clear adjusted spine. And so I, began, I was in my climb every mountain phase at that time. This is in the early 90s, right? And I began to read everything I possibly could on holistic nutrition at that time. I was guided into the, into the aura and the influence of four of the top people in the world in individual areas of study at that time. And one of these was uh, Richard Anderson, the naturopath, the specialist in colon detox. And we're going to talk about that specifically in a minute. I just want to introduce all my early influences. The next guy was Dr. Stan Bynum. Now we're going to talk about enzymes in a minute here. The head of the National Enzyme Company back in the 20s was a guy named Edward Howell, MD. I have his book over there. We're going to talk about that as well. He had a he had a vice president of National Enzyme Company, Dr. Stan Bynum, PhD, and when Edward Howell died in 1988, Bynum took over National Enzyme Company, and he ran that until like just for a few years, and then he founded his own company in Phoenix, Arizona called Infinity. Now this, this was the, the, the top expert in enzyme nutrition in the world, was Stan Bynum. And the, the, the story of how I was introduced to Bynum in, in Phoenix, Arizona, that's a whole complicated story, but I'll just tell you that I became aware of 
Bioterrain analysis, live cell testing. Does, does everybody know what that means? I took that course. I took that course uh, in, in bioterrain analysis with Stan Bynum in the mid 90s. And it, that was in Phoenix. And it was all medical doctors and me in, in this room, you know, for, for a weekend. And, and we all just did, you know, pricking your finger, getting a, a drop of blood, looking at your blood on, on the microscope. We just did that identifying the common imbalances in human blood. And then I was really intrigued by this. I went with Bynum on several occasions. We traveled to the Philippines and to Asia, and we did hundreds of live cell tests in the third world. And we saw, the, we saw you know what I learned? I learned what the word stress really means in the third world. Stress does not mean your mother-in-law is coming over for the weekend. Stress means you live your life hovering between life and death. That's stress. And people who live like that, their, their blood has a certain look to it. It looks like hell. It looks really bad. So I'm going to show you a couple examples of that. So anyway, Bynum taught me so much. He taught me to think at the cellular level, especially when it comes to supplementation, when it comes to nutrition. Think about the, the concept of bioavailability. How much of your food is actually being broken down, digested, and actually getting to your cells? The, every cell of your body has requirements, just a couple requirements, every second of your life, from the moment of birth to the moment of death. What are they? To take in oxygen and nutrients and to expel wastes to the degree to which the cells of your body are allowed to perform these two functions, you will be healthy. And so that was Bynum who inculcated that idea, and that is directly coming from Edward Howell. So we'll talk more about Bynum in a minute here. Does anybody know who this handsome gentleman is? Okay, this is, this is, this is Patrick Flanagan, uh, wonderkind of antioxidants. Now, this is a whole long story too, but I'll just tell you that uh, he invented an antioxidant which has no peer in the world today. And I'm going to show you an example of that in a little while. And finally, this is Kem Shahani, uh, Kem Shahani PhD. He was the number one expert in probiotics and flora, flora in the world. He was the head of University of Nebraska department, uh, published many times in, in JAMA and top uh, medical journals. But he taught me about not only the importance, the critical importance of flora, but how they work in the body and why most Americans are deficient in flora and what that really means from an epidemiological standpoint. Okay, the, the detox program itself, which is extremely simple, it consists of a common sense diet, which we've, we've already talked about, and seven supplements. Now, each one of these supplements has a long story, which I don't have time to tell you, but each one, of, each one of these stories is delineated in a separate chapter on my website under chapters. So I'm just going to be doing excerpts from those chapters. The 60-day program, as I said, consists of this simple, common-sense diet and then seven supplements. And these are the seven supplements. Now, here's the philosophy of, of Bynum. Stan Bynum taught us this. As far as, as far as supplements go, number one, 95% of the supplements that you see in GNC, in Walgreens, and in the drugstores are manufactured either indirectly or directly by whom? Pharmaceutical Exactly, Dr. Wade has it. Their job is to make a beautiful label and to put the cheapest ingredients in those supplements as possible. Spend money on marketing and promotion. Outside of that, there is another category of supplements that are well made. They are valuable. They are nutritionally valid. We don't really need them on a daily basis for survival. There is another small, smaller category of that group 
which we really need for complete cellular nutrition and bioavailability, which we really need to clear the tract and clear the blood. And so Bynum always said, we want people to be spending the least amount of money possible on supplements, to be taking the least number of supplements possible, but still to enable the cells of our body to perform those two functions, to have a clear tract and clear arterial system all the time. That's the goal of a legitimate detox program. This is Stan Bynum coming right at you from the grave. That's exactly how he talked. Okay, the tract and the blood. The tract and the blood. 